country bus, North country bus, clumsy and cumbersome rumbus to us. Country bus, North country bus, though you're a slow coach, you're okay for us, though your cargo is confusion. Sheepmen and cowgirls and chickens galore at the back. Mike Walker, I'm one of the three members of the Bristol Army Bus Vehicle Collection. The collection was founded getting over 20 years ago now by three of us who worked for Bristol Army Bus at one time or another and we decided that the vehicles and artefacts of the company were worth preserving. And that's what we've been doing. How do you manage to make sure they're kept somewhere safe? Because it could be a, a big cost through the winter, etc. It, it is. Uh, we're very lucky to have people we deal with who appreciate what we're doing and help us out. For instance, we're in the garage of Crosby Motor Services, the Western Supermare, and they rent us space. As you can see, it's a lovely big building. Keeps our vehicles dry during the, the, the winter months and keep them well, well looked after. We also have some vehicles in Chepstow, where an operator rents us space. And believe it or not, as far as food is Barry Island, where we've been able to get space at a reasonable price. And that is the problem, the price. <laughs> We started, as I said, around about 20 years ago, and we gradually built up our collection. Virtually all of them, I won't say all of them, virtually all of them were manufactured in Bristol at Bristol Commercial Vehicles, which was an offshoot of the Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company, which was founded by Sir George White back in 1875 as a tramway company. The vehicles we have been able to find date from... We've got one from 1929, although that's not restored yet mostly from after the war, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even up to the early 80s. You just talked about tramways there, because, as I understand it, they conked out and they were gotten rid of pretty much after World War II. The tramways in Bristol, packed up during World War II, wasn't intended. They were stretched out during the war, kept a bit longer, because, of course, they didn't use fuel, and fuel was precious. But, unfortunately, a bomb dropped on the power supply during one of the raids on Bristol and that put the trams out of action permanently in the early 1940s. But there were a lot of buses being built, I would imagine, in the late 40s, 1950s and being exported all over the world. Yes, Bristol Commercial Vehicles, which at that time was owned by Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company, so it was just a separate offshoot and called Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company Motor Construction Works. During the war, they built for war work. They had been building buses before the war, and they built buses long after the war, right up until the 80s, and they had their heyday during the 40s, 50s and 60s. They were exporting, certainly, during the 40s to India, to South Africa. But unfortunately, when the company which Bristol Tramways belonged to, the tilling organisation, was nationalised there was a stop put on building buses for anyone but nationalised companies. And so the Bristol Tramways Manufacturing Company and Bristol Commercial Vehicles then built only for the nationalised companies in Britain. So could we see whereabouts in Bristol now that the buses were actually built? Yes, um, Brislington on the way out from what used to be the HDV studios up the Bath Road, the Low Decker pub. On the left-hand side, out towards Bath, is on the site of Bristol Commercial Vehicles, that and the trading estate around the Low Decker pub. That's where the buses were built. And that's where, three days a week, right up to the 80s, chassis left, just a chassis, to be driven to Lowestoft in Suffolk to have the body put on. And that was another company owned by the tilling organisation and by the government. For certain types of bus, they built many thousands. I think the Low Decker would have production of low decker which would have run into thousands from the 50s right through to the 60s and why did it run down because there's nothing there now in fact i would be surprised if they're building any buses in bristol these days they aren't building buses in bristol no and in fact they're not building many buses in britain the company was taken over by leylands i believe it was the 60s leylands took a small shareholding and then eventually took over the factory and as a result of that closed it down and concentrated manufacturer up in lancashire This one, the one we're looking at, MHU 49, is in fact wasn't built in Bristol, but it was owned by the Bristol Tramways Company. It's a Bedford. It was built in 1949. There were 12 of these with this type of body. 
It was very difficult to get buses after the war, obviously. A lot of, a lot of buses had been destroyed in the war or had worked very, very hard carrying people to and from the factories. So there was a need for new buses. So the tramway company went out to other manufacturers and were able to buy some of these small single-deckers. In fact, this one, MHU 49, built in 1949, we know it worked here in Western Supermare in the very early 50s, running between the railway station and the marine lake. Well, it's about half the size. It's a single-decker yes. and about only about half the size of what you would think of a modern bus. Certainly. it's In fact, it seats 29, although can you believe that when it was new and right up until the 50s, it was drawn in 57, it had a conductor on it. So it, the driver didn't take the fares, even though it's such a small bus. Was that because m- many more people would have travelled by train and other methods in those days or not? Because th- this, actually, I suppose this is only a going short distances, this bus. It, this one would have been. And in fact, some were used on perhaps longer distances for an hour or so. Um, but you're quite right. The, the number of people travelling by bus was just monumental in those days compared with what it is now. On the journey, be, say, between the railway station and the marine lake, which is probably only about 10 to 12 minutes, it would have done that four or five times an hour and it would have carried 30, 40 people withstanding every time. It would have been very, very busy. How does what's happened with buses relate to what happened with the railways? Because there was a big, big change in the 1960s, wasn't there, with something like half the network being closed down? Probably for the same reason that a lot of the passengers using the buses disappeared. The private car and the television are the two main reasons bus travel disappeared. People stopped going out to places of entertainment because they had entertainment in the house, and they had their own private means of transport, which meant that they didn't need to use the bus. They're not going out to watch films at the cinema and the theatre in the evenings? That's quite right. In a lot of cases, the use of theatres and cinemas declined rapidly as people stayed at home and watched television. We're in a, what looks to me like an old aircraft hangar here. What's happened with this, I think it's either Locking or Western Airport, is it's slowly being built on houses. And I notice there's a great big construction site next door. You're quite right, this used to be part of Westlands. And in fact, it was the probably construction of helicopters, or at least parts for helicopters, in its day. All of the buses here, including this one which wasn't made in Bristol, did work in and around Bristol or the surrounding countryside because uh, Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company as it was up until 57 and became Bristol Omnibus Company and is now of course first um, ran as far north as Gloucester and Cheltenham and as far south or west as Bridgewater and on the left here we have um, a 1955 double-decker the way Bristol Tramways ran in the city of Bristol was through a separate organisation and they shared the operation with the Bristol City Council it's called Bristol Joint Services There was a 50% ownership by both of them. The Bristol Tramways provided the management and looked after the organisation, but they shared any profits or any losses. This was a Bristol Joint Services bus. Hang on, what's the bottom line? Was it profitable or were they losing money? Oh, it was profitable for a while, and then it started to lose money. And in fact, the joint services arrangement was disbanded in 1978 because there was um, discussions, shall we say, between the politicians in the city council and the people who then run the, bu- run the buses in Bristol Omnibus who wanted to put the fares up more and more to try and coop revenue that was being lost. The city council didn't want that, so there was a parting of the way. An interesting situation now with First, because they've just again and again put their fares up and the city council have actually had no say in it whatsoever. Quite right, there, there, there is no say. First is a purely commercial operation in Bristol now. Up until 1986 and um, the 1985 Transport Act, which ended up with bus deregulation, the bus operator would have needed a licence to run his routes and up until the 1980s would have in fact needed to go before a public inquiry to put fares up and would have got a lot of objections, obviously, and that became more and more difficult for the operator. That's not the case now. The operator sets his own fares. Now, uh, these two double-deckers yes. look a little bit like the London Routemasters. No, well, everyone says that, and I'm afraid they're completely different. Um, the one on the left here, 1955, there were 400-odd buses running the Bristol City services. 270 at one time were exactly like this, exactly the same. They six sixty people. This one actually has a, an engine built at Bristol Commercial Vehicles as well in Bristol. It does no more than 30 miles an hour. It was never intended to go outside of the 30-mile-an-hour limit. And all day, for 18 hours a day, for its 15-year life, it would have run up and down the streets of Bristol. 
no passenger heaters, so freezing in the cold. I used to go to school on these in the winter, very, very cold inside, but a reliable and rugged workhorse. As you can see, it's still here. It was built in 1955. It's well over 60 years old now, and it's still very, very reliable. What were they like to drive, these old buses? If you're not used to it, you'd describe it as pig. Manual gearbox, no power steering, four-speed gearbox, double declutching. This one, the one on our right here, which is a 1946 chassis, probably worse so than the 1955 one. For our younger listeners, a lot of them won't know what double declutching is. (laughs) Yes, double declutching, where you have to dip the clutch and let the clutch back up again in between gear changes to allow the engine revs to match the revs of the gearbox to allow the gears to mesh. If you don't, there will be an awful noise. Right, so the idea is you've got to kind of guess what's going on inside the gearbox to make sure that the various cogs are going roughly the same speed before you put the gears in. Exactly, and you do that by judging the note of the engine and knowing your road speed. Let's hand it to them, the people who drove these things 12, 14 hours a day, all of their working life, they were professionals. A bus driver's job in some ways was not exactly very highly classed but they knew what they were doing to avoid mechanical problems and they were professionals driving them i would imagine they they did break down quite a bit maybe even i don't know how they compare to modern buses there's so many complicated things on a modern bus much more than one of these definitely it was quite unusual to see one of these broken down in fact in the early days in the 40s and the 50s particularly if one of these broke down on the road the company would try to hide it in the best way they could and then probably tow it away at night so that no one could see it. But they are very reliable. There's a lot less to go wrong than there is in these days. In fact, it's all mechanical. Apart from the lights, there's nothing electrical. Amazing. What about this one next yeah, to the light, One next is 1946 is the chassis, built just after the war, and the body, in fact, is three years later, 1949. And the reason for that is when this vehicle was built in 1946... The materials were still austerity from the war, and by the 1950s, the bodywork on it, which had been made from wood, started to collapse because it was unseasoned. They got whatever they could to make the body out of. So the body was no good. They had actually built newer bodies onto pre-war chassis after the war, so they they married the two up in the 50s and put a, a 1949 body on the 46 chassis. Identical buses, but from a different vintage. Exactly, yes. They're the same design. The engine's at the front. The platform at the back is open for people to get on and off of. They seat about the same, 60 for the one on the left, 59 the one on the right. But they're just a development. The one on the left, the 1955 one, is simply a development of the one on the right. The double-decker we have here, which is a 1966 one, a deregistered one, was the final version built by Bristol and operated in Bristol with the engine at the front. Double-deckers, like single-deckers, ended up at that time with the engine at the back for two main reasons. The principal one being, if the engine was at the back, you could operate the bus without a conductor because the driver could be by the door. As you see in this 1966 when the driver is still in isolation in the cab at the front and the conductor works the bus and communicates with the driver by means of bells to tell him when to go and when to stop. The engine, as I say on this one, is is at the front. Again, it's a Bristol-built engine. It was actually built at Bristol Commercial Vehicles, but the same sort of thing, 30 to 35 miles an hour, never intended to go outside of the city, although others were built with faster engines for the country services. It's got the door at the front. And it seats 70 people rather than 60. Well, I notice uh, this, whatever it is, 15, 10, 15 years later version has also got automatic doors, whereas the older buses have got the ones you just hop on and off. That's quite right. Which I rather like, actually. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't remember many accidents having travelled on them, but the door, it became thought of as safer to move the door to the front when they could um, because the door could then be controlled by the driver. And with 10 extra seats in this bus... 70 seats, the conductor had far more fares to collect, so the driver was able to control the doors. Well, I guess you know they would get full up quite regularly too, especially in the rush hour. Definitely. Um, I, I did bus conducting in Bristol in 1969 on buses like this, and I have left people behind in the middle of Broadmead on an eight service to Warmley, probably with 10 or 12 standing inside, so 80-odd people on, and still leaving people behind. Now, this one is a number 18 to Old Market. Is that genuine, or have you you used a bit of creative imagination there? Well, the 18 did actually go through Old Market, but that is pure, shall we say, 
messing around, you can alter the numbers and the, and the destination to read what you want. Obviously, it's done by the driver in the cab. Have you got a full range of different destinations on these? They tended to have a range of destinations operated by the depot that the bus was based at. So there would be a whole range of destinations for Winterstoke Road Depot, for Lawrence Hill Depot, for Avonmouth Depot, to different parts of the city. Now I wonder, are these buses legal nowadays? Because I would have thought that all sorts of bureaucracy and regulations that would say, oh gosh, for example, you can't run a bus that you can just jump on and off that hasn't got automatic doors. Nothing wrong with it. Um, You can get them still licensed to carry fare-paying passengers. Ours aren't, just because we don't use them to carry fare-paying passengers. When we take people on them, we give them free rides. It's almost like grandfather's rights. The vehicle was allowed to carry passengers in its heyday. It can carry passengers now. Now, most of these buses you've shown me so far are doing around about 30 miles an hour. Mm. This one you've got next to you here is a lot faster. That looks like it could probably do... 70. Uh, yeah, you wish. Um, yes, this is, <laughs> this is a 1966, again, made in Bristol, a single-decker coach, and it's got the engine under the floor rather than at the front. That development came on in the 1950s. By moving the engine under the floor, you could have more seats because you didn't have the engine taking up space. But it didn't mean the floor was higher, so you could really only do it with a single-decker. Bristol Omnibus and Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company had a coaching operation where they did express services to London, to Cheltenham, all around the southwest, and indeed did private hires. It was called Bristol Greyhound because the company had taken over the Greyhound Motors, which ran in Bristol up until the 1920s. And Greyhound Motors had the distinction of providing the very first express coach service in the world between Bristol and London in February 1925. And the Bristol Greyhound coach between Bristol and London was that development. This one underfloor engine manual gearbox still still no power steering it does 50 a good speed in those days actually looks like you get terrific visibility out of here in fact it's almost all windows it it is um this is a 1966 version the 1965 version in fact didn't have this curved windscreen it had more of a a conventional arrangement with a corner pillar but yeah it's actually brilliant visibility it really is i had this one out about two months ago when i took a shepton mallet history group party out to devices and it, it goes really well i mean it must be quite awkward for you trying to care for these buses and yet you can't i mean obviously that you could fill them up with people but you're not allowed to charge anything no i'm not allowed to charge but what we do it because we want to keep them running and the best way of keeping a vehicle running is to run it we just have to hope nothing much goes wrong the other it thing does. is of course you see a lot of these in museums which mm. is a pity it seems to me the best place to see it is out on the road Definitely, yes. Um, That's our view, which is why, whilst we keep them inside, several times a year we will try and get them out and let people ride on them to experience what what it was like riding on vehicles of this age. Are you actually able to hire these out to groups? You can do. In fact, this one here, the one we talked about, the coach, is MOT'd so that it can be hired out. There's a different class of MOT to a vehicle, whether you're going to hire it to people or whether you're not. This one is a class six MOT, but we haven't got the license to run it. Both of our other members of this group run bus companies and they can use this with their bus company if they want to, to take people out and charge them. But as individuals, we can't. Which is a great pity, although if if you happen to be on one of the routes of one of those bus companies, you might be rather surprised and delighted one day to find one of these things turning up apart from your modern, normal bus. But there would be a narrow problem, especially on an ordinary local bus route, because from the beginning of this year, you have to provide a vehicle which has disabled access or a full accessibility for wheelchairs. So certainly the one here, the 66 coach, which has got three or four steps into the saloon, couldn't be used on ordinary bus service. Nor, in fact, could the double-decker here. Even though it's got a flat floor, the 66 double-deck, it would be difficult to get a wheelchair in here. So it wouldn't be allowed to be used. You can use it on hires and on wedding hires and things if you wanted to, but you couldn't use it on regular service. Country bus, north country bus, rollerking, frolicking, uproarious. Country bus, north country bus, you're rusty and you're dusty, but you're okay for us, though your seats are rather spartan. We've got the springs in our backsides to ride out your bounce. Though you may stumble, 
After the dance on a Saturday night Backseat lovers don't grumble They seem to manage all right Amorous Scandalous So you've got a bit of a job on your hands to make sure these things do keep running. Whereabouts might people be able to see them through the year? Well, up until a few years ago, we regularly turned them out twice a year in Bristol in May and in August. May, there was a harbourside rally. There were 70, 80 of this type of vehicle come to the harbourside rally. We had our 15 or so there. And in August in Brissington at the Park and Ride site on a Sunday, where we would always have a, a big event in connection with the Avon Valley Railway. Unfortunately, both of those don't run anymore due to problems getting the spaces. There was a rally in Chippenham in May. And we will have a small number out at the beginning of September, the second weekend, when there's open doors in Bristol, when all the museums are thrown open. And we will be running uh, a half a dozen or so of our vehicles out of Bristol from the harbour side at Bristol. Uh, Two of them, every half an hour, will be going up to the Rocks Railway at Clifton, which is open. And another two will be going on a short tour of the city. And they will be buses from the 50s and 60s. It's nice to see that some of these Bristol buses are actually accessible to see and get on and ride on in Bristol but uh, it doesn't seem like it's very easy for that to happen. No it's not the problem is trying to find a space big enough to allow 20 or 30 or even more vehicles to come down for the day and provide rides for people it's quite difficult as I said we did do it at Harborside that's not become available to us unfortunately the people organizing these events did find a place in Chippenham as I say and that will happen again next year but there are still other rallies and events and the, the on the Sunday of the Open Doors event there is a, a large display and allowing people to ride on them at the Helicopter Museum in Western Supermare at which Crossville will have their old vehicles and we will have some of ours. Well I'm disappointed that people in Bristol have got a bit of an effort really to actually even see any of these buses that were, have got the city's name on the side. Yeah, unfortunate yes. One of our colleague organisations Bristol Vintage Bus Group who are at Brislington at Flowers Hill They open three or four times a year and they will also be opening on the Sunday of Open Doors event and probably having some of their vehicles running in and out of Bristol to carry people up to them. So there will be some option within the city on the Saturday and Sunday to ride on it. Just remind us of the dates of that again because I think if anyone wants to see one of these, that's the day, isn't it? It is. It's the second weekend of September. I think that might be the 9th or 10th. Um, And certainly on the Saturday and the Sunday from at Bristol, either up to Clifton or around the city or probably up to Bristol Vintage Bus Group site. And on the Sunday as well, Western Helicopter Museum for the Crossville uh, running day. Now I can actually see a, a couple more buses down the back there. Are they yours too? One of them is. Let's go and have a look. The single decker here is um, 1968 and was the development of the deregistered coach we've just been talking about where... On the deregistered coach, the engine was in, under the floor in the middle. The later development of that was called the, the Bristol RE, still built in Bristol. RE meaning rear-engined. And the engine was shoved right to the back of the vehicle. By so doing, it meant that the floor at the front could be quite low, and it meant the driver could control the door. And so it was an easier access for people to go about their business. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these built. Bristol had 300 alone, although this is a shorter version. It seats 43, and it's got a a massive engine, a Leyland 680. It's about 11 litres, and they were known during the day uh, as really, really quick buses, which meant, of course, with traffic congestion getting worse, the drivers could keep time better. So you're saying during the day, was that 60s and 70s? Yeah, it was this one was built in 1968, and the variations probably lasted until the 90s. In fact, when bus deregulation came in in the mid-80s, 86, this type of bus was the mainstay of the operation of people like Badgerline, who ran them on country services. And in Bristol City, they had them with a door in the middle as well. They had two doors, so that you got on at the front and came out in the middle. This particular type wouldn't have gone abroad very much. Um, There were a hundred and something of them built brand new to go to New Zealand, Christchurch Transport wanted some single-deckers, and this was the best sort. Because of the way the engine's positioned, the axle weights are very different to a normal rear-engine bus. They're actually very, very clever. They, although the engine's at the back, the gearbox is in the middle, so the drive comes across the back axle and then goes back again, which means not all the weight is at the back, and that helped. When Christchurch wanted buses, it didn't have a heavy weight on the rear axle. Over 100 went to Christchurch, and in fact, I was able to bring one back a few years ago, and we keep it at Barry.
Hang on, you brought it back from Christchurch, New Zealand, yeah. right, well, on a ship, I hope. Uh, yeah, in fact, it had moved on to another operator by then. I went across a few times to see them, and I bought it. It wasn't very expensive. The shipping back cost about six times the cost of the bus. But it came back a few years ago, and it's, it's a beautiful runner. We had it running in Barry only the other month. What about mileage in a lifetime? Because these have had several lifetimes, these buses. The buses with nine lives, in a way. Yeah. How many miles would a bus like this expect to be able to do? <sighs> They don't do very much now. I wonder if they've gone round the clock. I would imagine they probably have. They probably did. I would thought half a million miles or more would not be untoward for a vehicle working 200 miles a day every day for a 15 or 20 year life. And how well were they maintained? Oh, in the days when they were run proper, I'm not saying we don't maintain them now, but in the days when they did regular operation, they were a specific schedule where they'd be called in for different types of services every day. Every, month, every week, every month, and then every year or so with MOTs, of course, they'd be stripped out. Right up until the 70s, until MOTs as such came in for buses, they had a thing called a certificate of fitness when they were new, and that was allowable for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, they'd be stripped right down to almost to component parts and rebuilt again and then put back on the road. So they were always well maintained. It would not do any organisation that ran buses any good to have vehicles that did broke down often or which caused accidents obviously now these were most of them built for work with the conductor now that's all changed hasn't it yes it was as you see most of the double deckers we've been talking about would have had conductors this g registered single decker was built purposely for use without the conductor and conductors disappeared in the 70s and early 80s and when it became possible because of the moving of the engine at the back for the single deckers and again for the double deckers when the engine was put to the back for the conductor to be dispensed with. Slowed things down, unfortunately, but it reduced operating costs. Oh, as someone who's worked as a conductor yourself, what's the difference between conductor having a, having a conductor on board or not? A bus is much quicker with a conductor on board because the, the passengers can get on, the door's closed, and the bus moves. The conductor then takes turns to go around the bus and collect the fares whilst the driver is moving to the next stop. Now, in heavy peak hours, that didn't matter so much. I've been on buses and conducted them in Bristol when everyone has gone on and the doors have closed and the bus hasn't moved because it's been stuck in traffic. So that didn't make a great deal of difference. The main problem is, of course, off-peak times and evenings when it might have made a difference. And gradually companies move more and more towards simplifying fares so that the driver doesn't have to handle change. He doesn't have to issue tickets. Someone might have a weekly or monthly ticket or, as in fact, what happens in Bristol now, on their mobile phone. And it's so much quicker then if they can just show their phone to the driver. I was at Western Supermare Depot for nine years from 1974 and there were certainly instances where the lack of a conductor had caused a problem on a double-deck bus where kids upstairs were slashing seats and the driver, of course, had to remonstrate with them and that caused problems. If there had been two people on the bus, it might have been a bit different, but it's just a fact of life. There aren't two people on the bus now. They're also doing the same with trains, aren't they, pretty much? And there's been lots of um, industrial disputes recently on the Brighton lines and South West trains and things like that over that. Indeed, yes. Um, there were, of course, industrial disputes, which never got to strikes, I must admit, or to overtime bans. But there were disputes about taking the conductor off of buses in some of the routes in and around Bristol, principally about what the driver would be paid, because the driver, of course, got an enhancement to work the bus on his own. And there were different enhancements depending on what type of route, whether it was a town or a city or a country route. So there were always negotiations ongoing to get these operating without conductors. This one is a a Bristol RE. Yes. Just run us through the main different types of of buses that there were. If we go from after the war, because before the war much was the same, the ones we looked at at the beginning, the 46 and the 55 ones, are the derivative of the Bristol K-type. Bristol tramways and then Bristol commercial vehicles did all of their chassis types by letter. So the K and the L were the double and single deck versions and they would have been superseded by what should have been the M and the N, although they did change the system. But the K-type was the general mainstay right up until the 50s when the Bristol Low Decker came in. And the Bristol Low Decker is the one you've got just here, which is the deregistered 70-seater. That was actually introduced in the 1950s. And the main difference between the K-type and the Low Decker was Bristol developed an axle that allowed the drive to go into one side of the axle and then come down under the floor, which meant you could have a very much lower floor. And that meant the bus could be lower, which was great for low bridges. 
So the double-deckers went to K-type to the low-decker and then on to the Bristol VR, which we haven't got an example of here, but it's a double-decker which had the engine at the back and allowed the driver to take the fares. On the single-deck front, the single-deck version of the K-type was the L-type, and that was a single-decker. There are some over, uh, one of, a coach over there which belongs to me, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, that had the engine at the front, just like the double-deckers. On from that came the lightweight saloon and the MW, and this 1966 coach is the MW version, where the engine was taken from the front and put under the floor. And that was developed in the 60s into the RE that we've just talked about. I suppose another aspect to all of this is, you touched on briefly there, is, is this congestion. Bristol's getting absolutely choked. I suppose in the 1970s, maybe it was in the 80s when bus lanes first kept, came in, but this, these can be really crucial in actually keeping the buses moving I, I sometimes complete gridlock in the city it is and in fact in my career working in Bristol Army bus I saw that develop because I can remember even in the early 70s when the company was introducing a bus location system where certain vehicles on certain routes were tracked electronically so that the, the inspectors knew where they were even then on a wet day congestion got so bad that you would have three four five buses running together where they were blocked up Bus lanes did make a difference, but they have to be in the right place, obviously. We've got a system now where there's a little display up, up isn't there? I suppose you, your passengers would have loved that in your day, saying there's going to be three minutes until this bus arrives. But I wonder, do they actually work those? Yes, uh, they do, and I've, I've seen them in London as well, as well as in Bristol. And they are, of course, only as good as the information they're given. So a bus leaves a bus stop around the corner and says it's going to be at the next bus stop in two minutes. And then if something happens and it doesn't get there, obviously the information isn't quite as accurate as it could be. Yeah, I mean, but I, I've seen happens. buses disappear off the system yes. completely. You're yeah. sitting there, it's going to be three minutes, it's yeah. going to be two minutes, and it suddenly disappears. Yeah, I think it's getting better all the time, because whereas it used to work on schedule and some years ago, it now works on actuality, because the buses are tracked by satellite or something similar. And in fact, on modern buses, even the ticket machine will track where the bus is and send that information back to control, and they know exactly where things are. And that's sent out to the real-time information system. Do you think there's a future for the buses you've got in your collection? That's the worry all of us have. I talk with a number of people who've got similar collections and we have several worries. One is whether we can afford to keep them, obviously. Two is whether we can afford to get the spare parts to keep them. Third is whether we can still find spaces to keep them. And fourth is what will happen to them after we die. There is an organisation, National Association of Road Transport Museums, who liaise with government and uh, Department of Transport on matters like that. And as long as our corner is being fought, hopefully things will be OK. But I- I'm 68 now. I don't know how much longer I can keep them going, to be honest, because who knows what's going to happen. If anyone listening is interested in helping out and keeping these things going, you know, whether that's manpower, woman power, or financially, I'm sure you'd be happy to hear from them. But let's finish by having a look at your last bus you were talking about. Yes, come on. Yeah. We don't personally don't hire our vehicles out, but we've got a number of vehicles that are capable of being hired out because they have passed the necessary MOT and have one annually. Uh, one over here is from our collection. That's a 1959 low-decker. I mentioned the low-decker before. The type of bus that became standard in Bristol City in the 50s, late 50s, with the very low back axle, which means the bus can go under low bridges. Right. Oh, they are low. They are low. You expect to be kind of sitting up, don't you? But you're not. You're not, no. Now we're, we're sitting in another vehicle of our collection, um, and this is a 1959 Bristol Low Decker, uh, again made in Bristol commercial vehicles. And I mentioned the Low Decker before. This was a special design built by Bristol uh, where the transmission coming out of the engine actually goes down one side of the bus instead of down the middle of the bus and into um, an, a back axle, which is specially designed. It takes the drive on one side and then drops it down under the floor to bring it back up on the other side. So you see it's got a sunken gangway and it's very much lower. It's about a foot lower than a conventional bus. This one is actually class 6 MOT, which means it's capable of being used for hire. It's actually on loan to Crosford Motor Services at Western and they use it for weddings and special events. It's surprising how many people request open top buses or vintage clothes buses 
for their wedding event to take people to and from reception or simply to take the bride and groom away from the church. It's not so surprising when you consider how much people will be drinking. uh, That's that's a fair comment as well. Yes, that's true. Um, But when it's just the bride and groom, it's a bit different. But no, you're quite right. And so there is a reasonable business of wedding hire. And you see Crosby Motors is a number of vintage vehicles here which are used for that purpose. The other thing with this uh, low decker is you've got the only bus I've ever seen, I think, with a seat right at the very front of the lower deck facing back. That's right. And the reason for that is because the engine has to slant slightly to get the drive over to the offside, the gearbox is in a strange position behind the engine and that seat facing backwards is actually over the gearbox. Otherwise, the gearbox would come into the saloon. They decided... That was the best way of of obscuring it, by putting the seat there. And that was quite common in Bristol in the late 50s, riding on one of these. I can remember riding on them. You didn't ever want to quite make eye contact with the people you were sat opposite. It was a bit embarrassing sometimes. This was kind of the height of technology at the time. And Bristol's been quite good at this, hasn't we? We produced the Concorde as well. What's happened? Because very little manufacturing at all happening anymore. Yeah, um, I... As to what's happened, I don't know. Um, There is still manufacturing in the UK for buses, not in Bristol, unfortunately. And one, Alexander Dennis, is certainly at the forefront of of manufacturing of low-floor double-deckers. But um, I think what happened to the bus industry was there was a decline. There was a decline in the number of people using the bus. Then there was a decline... Because of the car, mainly. Because of the car, mainly, yes. And everyone... I wanted a car when I was a teenager. Who didn't? And then towards the 80s, when there was... The possibility of bus deregulation, which actually happened, and privatisation of the state-owned companies. A lot of companies didn't buy buses because they didn't know what the future was going to pan out. As a result of that, manufacturers couldn't survive and they were consolidated into just one or two, which is why Bristol Commission Vehicles unfortunately went the way it did. Also, I can remember seeing some film of Filton when uh, there was a lot of aircraft manufacturing and other manufacturing going on up there. When it was chucking out time, five o'clock in the evening, my God, there was a whole queue of a fleet of buses needed to take everyone back home and towards the city centre. That's certainly true. In my days when I joined Bristol Omnibus in 1968, I worked in the Shedworth department and I would guess probably 100 of the 400 or so buses in Bristol City would have ended up at Filton or Patchway at some time during the working peak. It was so important to the company in terms of the revenue that there were regular meetings between the company's management and Rolls-Royce and BAC staff representatives to deal with any problems of buses not turning up or buses needing retiming. And it was a constant getting on top of the work by changing things, maybe only by five minutes or a few minutes. But there were so many people using the bus in those days. I suppose that's one of the reasons why maybe um, the council is now having to subsidise bus routes. And in fact, there's some of them, even just recently, there's threats to take some bus routes off. It does seem that, um, you know, it would be helpful if money can be made from buses, that that money is returned to the council. Also, there are a lot of things that, you know, when I chat to councillors, they'll say, well, if only we could control the routes and control something to do with you know the way they operate and even sometimes the fares because they get very angry that the fares are are so high and it's actually forcing people to use the car when otherwise they might use the bus a couple of things on that Uh, you got me started on a subject i really love where do we start yes buses are commercial now what the local authority can do is provide bus services that the commercial operators don't want to provide and they are empowered so to do obviously through money that is paid to them by council taxpayers. Several things come out about that. That's usually in rural areas because mostly in the city, most travel options are covered by the commercial operator. Most, I won't say all of them, obviously. Now, of course, central government has been cutting local authority funding, so that's caused a problem. The outgoing Labour government introduced concessionary travel passes that allow people over 60 or of a pensionable age to travel free. That's paid for by the local authority, And the money for that has been cut. So the bus operator doesn't get perhaps all they should get. In terms of control, of course, one one shouldn't forget that right up until 1979, Bristol Corporation did have a half control of Bristol City buses. And they let it go for various reasons at the time. Now, under the latest buses bill, which is now an act, I believe, they can get powers to franchise bus operations, which will mean they will determine the routes and the fares they will then tender out to operators to run those services. They have to go various, through various hoops to enable them to get that. But that is an option available to them in due course. 
maybe I'm speaking as someone with a perhaps a bus enthusiast head on, but I really don't think there is a great deal of money in running buses, to be perfectly honest, with the cost of vehicles these days, the cost of wages. Buses aren't that profitable. If you compare them with the return made on a big FTSE 100 company, then probably the profit margin is very, very small. But that actually might be acceptable, even just a small amount of profit for a local authority, because they're used to spending out on things. Everybody is telling local government now that they've actually got to make a, a return, even a small return on what they do. Yeah, I, I agree. But of course, the, the companies operating these routes at the moment are private companies and have a responsibility to their employees and their shareholders to make a return on their capital as well. Local authorities are being given the possibility of running their own companies, I think, again, if they go through certain hoops. But certainly there aren't that many local authorities now who run their own bus companies, there's a small handful in Wales. But they have to be treated as arm's length companies, so they too have to return something on their investment. All you have to do is a few days, the bus doesn't turn up, they're starting to think, stood shivering by the bus stop, I'm going to have to buy a car. Mm. Quite true, yeah. And there's sometimes a variety of reasons why buses don't turn up. They shouldn't. They should all turn up, obviously. And I know no bus company in their right mind would set out to not wanting buses to turn up on time. But with traffic congestion, with staff failures and with vehicle breakdowns, um, it's quite possible. I know for a fact it's very, very difficult to get staff who want to drive buses these days because of, shall I say, the traffic congestion and the hard work that is involved in it. And I know that bus companies now have open days at their depots to try and attract staff. Now, as a conductor, you've obviously seen lots of passengers. You're very well versed with the public. Do they have good days and bad days? Oh, without a doubt, yes. They have um, off days as well. The ones I remember particularly, and you knew who they were going to be. If you stand at the centre at 10.35 at night on the back of the bus and people get on, you know they're a bit tipsy. As soon as someone says to you, all right, mate, you know when you go upstairs you want me to get the money out of them because they don't want to pay. Um, admittedly, with one-man buses, that's less so now. But, yeah, you can read passengers. Do they have good days as well? Oh, God, yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, and I enjoyed that side of it. I must admit, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to people most of the time. When I was conducting in Bristol, I tended only to conduct in the evening peak and on Saturdays. Yes, Saturday crowds were usually a lot better because it was their happy day off. But it depends on the individual, obviously. Some people are just not as happy as others. They're thinking about a congestion charge in Bristol. Some would say that that's all deliberate. They love the congestion and the metro bus they're about to bring in isn't really going to make much of a difference to congestion because they want the congestion charge. But if they do, it might mean more buses. Well, it could well do. I don't think there's any problem with local authorities supporting extra buses on certain routes if they want to and, and if the money comes in from the congestion charge. And that's quite possible. Now, there's one more bus. Let's go and have a look at that final. The last vehicle I've got to show you is... Um, I talked about the types of buses... And those were the engine at the front after the war. We had the K-type double-decker and the L-type single-decker made at Brislington. This is an L-type single-decker, but it's a different one. It's not a bus, it's a coach. I showed you the Greyhound coach from 1966. This was its precursor just after the war. During the war, express services to and from London and places like the South Coast and excursions were obviously stopped because the fuel resources were needed. And after the war, there was a slow start to getting express services back on the road and using mainly pre-war vehicles. Bristol and the coach builder, Eastern Coachworks at Lowestoft, came up with this design in the late 1940s to try and make the coach more attractive now that they could reinstate coach services. I think maybe today the designers may have lost a little bit of the uh, understanding that it needs to look nice. I think there's a difference today in the way they're approached. Every coach design these days goes through the wind tunnel to check that it's actually efficient in terms of drag for fuel efficiency. That wasn't the case here, obviously. They made it aesthetically pleasing. It's still got a radiator at the front, as you can see. And if you look inside, in the cab, you can see how simple things were. The driver sat by the engine. He has a gear lever, he has a steering wheel, he has a handbrake. And he's got a couple of dials which show, first of all, where the gear positions are. 
and then secondly, his speedometer, and thirdly, it's the vacuum gauge for the brakes. That's all he's got. But this came out in 1950 in the end, and there were three of these in Bristol. There were only 30-odd produced. 31 seats, regularly used between Bristol and London, and on excursions and tours. I've seen pictures of these, stood at Clevedon, outside the pier with a board in front saying excursion to Western Supermare, as people would have been, they've gone to Clevedon for the afternoon, taking an excursion to Western on one of these. I still use it today, it's got a top speed of about 50, and again, it's got an engine built in Bristol, so it's a bristol orientated vehicle with the chassis, engine, gearbox and everything built here. And there are two left in the world, this one and one in Essex, which is identical. It's got Bristol's own engine. Bristol developed their own diesel engines after the war. And because they were um, an operator as well as a manufacturer, they developed them for their own circumstances. And the engine in this is quite high revving compared with some of the ponderous diesel engines. And it meant not only could the coach go faster, but the bus that they put it in could accelerate quickly between stops. So if you're running a bus in Bristol, four stops a mile, if you had the Bristol engine in it, it would accelerate quicker between the stops and therefore get to the end a lot better than it would have been with the slow ponderous Gardner engines, which they also put in. It might sound like a stupid question, but why would a bus have a diesel engine, not a petrol engine? Buses had petrol engines up until the war, and in fact a few afterwards, but the diesel was found to be far more fuel efficient. Petrol engines drunk a lot of petrol because they were very, very big. The little Bedford I showed you right at the beginning still has a petrol engine, three and a half litre, and it probably only does about eight or nine to the gallon. This coach here with the Bristol diesel engine probably does 15 or 16 to the gallon. So it was much cheaper to run having a diesel engine and much more reliable. They tended to go on longer and be better suited to pulling heavier loads. Country bus, North Country bus, lusty and rustic and impetuous. Country bus, North Country bus, Bog trotting bumpkin, you're okay for us, though your progress is uncertain. Especially at night when the public house closes its doors. You tend to dodder, staggering home from the Bull Hotel. We, we never bother. Cause we've got the staggers as well Glorious Notorious Today's buses, the ones we see on the routes in London, Bristol, where, where are they made nowadays? There is a, an operator in Northern Ireland who makes a lot of the bodies called Wrights, but Alexander Dennis from Falkirk in Scotland and I think from Aldershot make a lot of double-deckers, but a lot of double-deck chassis are from abroad. They're Scania's or they're Volvo's. What about coaches? Who, who are the big coach makers now? Uh, uh, again, chassis-wise, Volvo, Scania, and coming onto the market in the UK now, China, with uh, a Yutong, which Crossville certainly have some of. We'll have to watch out for some of those Yutongs in Bristol. Well, you might see them, yes. I, I know they're around, and uh, they're probably cheaper because they're Chinese import, but they've not been here very long, so it depends what their life will be. Who knows? Well, China, I suppose, is doing, isn't it, what we were doing maybe in the 1940s and 50s, exporting around the world with the top-notch technology and probably yes. cheaper than anyone else. Yes, that's probably quite right, yeah. And they do try and make a market, and certainly there are dealers here in Britain who are bringing them in for coach operators. <laughs> 